Hey guys, this is Marty Kine. I'm an SVP at Salesforce and uh, going a little bit rogue here today. This is episode five of my back to work webinars. Thank you for sticking with me this far. This is my second to last webinar, maybe third to last, I haven't decided yet. Uh, and the topic today is this demystifying the customer data platform CDP. So to start, I wanna go back in time, way, way back when uh, CPMs for video was, were about $4 and uh, click-through rate on ads was about you know 95%. And basically, we're in the world of 1963, before a lot of us were born, 1962. And in rural Wisconsin, there was this place, this operation called the Society of the Divine Savior Data Processing Center. This is real, and these are actual pictures. I stumbled on it when I was going through a, uh, a blog I used to like called Paleo Future. So these are sort of futuristic visions from the past. And But this was a real operation. It was a Catholic charity that um, sent out a lot of direct mail trying to raise money for various worthy causes. And as I said, they were located in rural Wisconsin, and they used a state-of-the-art state of the art system at the time. It was an IBM 650 Series 900 data processing system. They spent about $12,000 a month, so they leased it from IBM. And um, that, in today's dollars, is equivalent to $2 million a year. So it's a, you know, a hefty expenditure. Uh, the, it uh, worked by taking punch cards, which is the way you spoke to computers in those days. Uh, punch cards were input into the system at a rate of about 500 an hour, and it could output a thousand mailing labels. Those typewriters you see on the right were automated. Um, they were supervised by people <laughs> with a lot of hair, but they were automated, and they were capable of outputting about 800 uh, custom lines of letterhead um, in uh, in a minute, so it was, it was a lot of different letters that were put out, um, customized to the people in the flock. And then this is um, a picture of their Martech stack, 1962 era. So we see card inputs there in the data tapes. Data was stored in those days on reel-to-reel -reel magnetic tapes. Then the processor, which was the brains of the system, and a label printer. So they have a single channel here, you might call it, which is direct mail. And then the, they had a measurement closed loop, which is that as the solicit solicitations and donations came in the door somebody would uh, keep tabulate them um, punch them out punch out the results on a punch card and then put it back into the, the system uh, through the data tapes and the processor and um, what was most interesting to me is that every single person and uh, sometimes at the household level had a line uh, a dedicated line on the data tape. It was a customer record and it was 256 alphanumeric characters long and it was coded. So, and it contained a lot of inf interesting information. It contained name, address, presence of children in the home, uh, estimated income, but also things like their propensity to give to different um, causes and what we might call, you know, pretty sophisticated statistical propensity models, predictive analytics, propensity models, uh, their, their likelihood to donate and the, the level of likely donation for certain categories of, of charity. So, uh, you know, this was essentially what I might call a proto customer data platform. And their response rate, if you're interested, was 80%, 80%, which seems, of course, like a miracle. And then fast forward many, many years, uh, 2018, back when I was a, an analyst at Gartner, and I wrote this column in Ad Exchanger called What is This Thing We Call a CDP? And it was as a result of, direct result of a Gartner clients calling me up and, and my colleagues up and saying, what is this thing? We were hearing about it. It's, uh, is it new? Is it something new? Did someone have an invention? Or uh, what are we talking about here? And I studied it a lot. I looked at it. I read all the literature. I talked to customers and clients. And, and uh, where I ended up was that uh, CDP is really just CRM for B2C. It's an evolution in the discussion. Uh, nobody really went into their basement and invented anything. Um, what we're talking about are the exact same conversational terms that were happening in the 80s, as we just saw in the 60s who knew, in the 90s and in the year 2000s. If you were being sold a CRM system for marketing in the 1990s, what did they promise? Uh, they promised marketing for CM, CRM in the 90s, promised single view of the customer. They promised uh, activation across channels, including email in the late 90s. And um, they promised closed loop measurement, and they promised uh, an ability to do analytics on this clean customer record. So that's, those are exactly what we're promising uh, today in the, in the year um, 2020 and beyond with the customer data platform. 
So it's an evolution. Um, but what has happened is that the channels have gotten have proliferated and consumers have become you know, even more demanding and the complexity has risen and the volume of data, as we all know, is exponentially increasing. Um, CDP as a phenomenon is also related to um, four things that are happening, four forces. If I were Scott Galloway, I would call these horsemen. Well, they're not really horsemen because uh, that's sort of a bad thing. But let's just call them uh, Icelandic horses, which are fuzzy and approachable. Uh, these four things are happening, and, and you all know what they are, and these are the ones we've identified in research and that, that I believe in, number one, integration. So the different channels and different departments have to integrate and have more of a platform approach, meaning one platform upon, upon which every department is able, to, uh, from which every department is able to gather data and then apply analytics and do whatever they need to do. Identity, so trying to get more and more with consent down to the level of targeting and measuring individuals or accounts rather than just groups, campaigns, segments, some higher order aggregate. AI, you know, looking more at the future, trying to predict what's going to happen. That's not stopping. And then speed, uh, rather than pre-planning every single campaign, sitting down and sort of charting out a nice campaign flow, um, trying to react more in the moment, more and more in the moment to what people are doing. Doing both, planning and reacting as we'll see, but getting more contextual with your marketing. The other thing that's happened is um, kind of neglected in the conversation, but an uber trend, is that the nature of marketing has changed quite a bit in the last 20 years. Marketing 20 years ago was, was quite different. It, was, it attracted people who, um, I mean, I'll be reductive, and I was one of them, so I am guilty as charged. People who kind of just wanted to hang out with celebrities someday and worry about fonts and uh, talk about feelings and not you know real feelings, but consumer feelings, and um, uh, get you know go on TV shoots and stuff like that. It was more of a kind of a brand or show business. Whereas today, twenty years later, it's completely different. It's you know it's uh, you have to be able to if you're a modern CMO, you have to be able to talk to data scientists and 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 talk to them in an intelligent and informed way and give them a, you know uh, uh, instructions and business use cases. And um, so I think the the first part hasn't gone away. By the way, you still still need to worry about fonts and still need to kind of talk to celebrities and go to can when it reopens but you have to also be a, a first class you know marketing statistician so it's a it's a bimodal career and that's probably why CMOs are so stressed out the other thing that we're all noticing is that the number of data sources is exploding this is the number of median median number of significant data sources and if you ask a company you know, like Unilever P&G how many applications are you using in marketing? Just count up every single application that you or partners using through any of your brands. They would probably, it's definitely in the hundreds. Um, Unilever is probably over 400. So, but significant internal data sources or significant external data sources that are housing customer data uh, had, had going up about 25% a year. And if you project this, this compound annual interest, if you project this out 10 years, we're talking about um, 140 sources. And if you project it out 100 years just for fun, you'll see that it's in the billions. So the other thing is uh, identity management has become quite sticky. For, um, you know, there's the whole issue of privacy and consent, of course, and some of that's regulated, but even just simple identity management, people uh, giving you different emails, um, spelling their name differently, moving, this has always been an issue, of course, um, providing mobile, you have a mobile number here or a browser cookie there. How do you resolve that all to the same person? And the reason that this is important is that people are transacting uh, and researching on different devices now more and more than ever. And uh, I mean, Facebook had a study that came out recently that said that uh, about 30, 35% of transactions that start on one device will end on another. So there's kind of cross-channel shopping going on, cross-channel browsing, um, a lot of cross-channel behavior. A lot of people will be watching linear or, or connected television on their screen, so multi-screen use. All of that needs to be resolved to an individual if you're going to do good marketing to an extent that wasn't important in the past. So CDP is, is, a, is a response to all of this. If I were to sum it up in a word, it would be uh, integration. So you have data sitting here, data sitting there. I need to harmonize it. Then I have uh, different IDs, ID sitting here, ID sitting there. I need to harmonize that. And uh, CMOs, you know, marketing departments, and all the way up to the C CDO and CEO level have recognized that um, this kind of 
uh, disintegration of data, disintegration of departments has got to stop, or they're going to be sort of falling behind the competitors. Um, so this this label came up, customer data platform. Now, there's no vendor out there that calls themselves a CDP that has a complete set of all these features. This is uh, an idealized de description that I got from the Customer Data Platform Institute, more or less, and adapted it. And in general, CDP-like objects, speaking generically, have these components. First of all, they have to be able to acquire data, either natively through tags, SDKs, or just simply import it you know, from file, in a file, batch file process, or in real time, stream it in. Then it has, there have to be some capabilities to process. Uh, cleaning, deduping, matching fields, matching identities. All of this is sort of resolving identities to an individual, as Salesforce says with Customer 360 data, data resolution engine, um, or matching fields. So for instance, like if you know Datarama, that does this, you, you'll take, um, you know, uh, a field in a, in a database that's like first name, and then another database might be F name, but it's both pointing to the first name. How do you reconcile those to make sure you're, you're in, your, in your final form of the database, or the final form of the data store, that you're actually including these, concat concatenating these or joining these um, columns, these attribute fields together so to, to reflect the fact that they're um, reflecting the same piece of information. And then exposed, so the data has to sit somewhere and it has to be available. And what's interesting about the exposed part here is that um, the exposed doesn't have, it's not, it's not really a monolith, it's kind of like the human brain. Part of it is for persistent storage and you want scale. So you want sort of infinite scale, be able to hold data for a long time. But some of it has to be available in real time. It has to be available for quick decisioning. If someone arrives on the site, you want to know what, um, for instance, you want to know if they're high value right away. You need to know that. Or you want to know if they're in a certain category of interest or so on. So that there are, we can see intuitively there are sort of two parts to the expose. Uh, and what I'm getting at is sort of in-memory data and, and more persistent data. Some vendors might say they have everything in memory. Um, but there's still, if you're having like a massive store, persistent data store, uh, and you, you want to keep your costs somewhat reasonable, uh, there probably will be some sort of bifurcation in the expose there. And then analytics and decision, those are optional. I mean, a lot of, a lot of platforms don't have a ton of analytics built in. Maybe, maybe they want to provide raw data to data scientists to do their own uh, modeling. And then the C, so most CDPs are not, I think, analytics, hardcore analytics systems. They're much more around data management. And then uh, they have to be available and push it out to whatever the channel of choice is. So if we look at, and I went through a bunch of RFPs, I went in a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, and I was saying, what are marketers actually asking for when they're asking for a CDP? You know, we ask them, what, what do you think you need? And um, it, it can be broken down into two groups, two, two kind of basic groups of needs, requirements. One is around real-time personalization. So marketers are saying, I want to respond in real-time, personalize. Um, somebody arrives on my site, I want to start personalizing the experience right away, the kind of thing that, that uh, Evergage does, for instance. And that I would call a system of engagement. And then there's a whole other thing, which I would, I would think is the, probably the primary use case for CDP is the bottom one, which is marketing database. I want to be able to discover new segments. I want a single view of my customer. I want a master marketing record. I want a kind of flexible data store where all the customer data can sit at the user level and it's available for doing AI, you know, really cool AI modeling, ML modeling, whatever. So you can see these are different. And this is getting at what I was trying to tease out earlier, there are two levels of, of CDP. One is, one is much more around the real time in the moment, um, but it's not a full customer view, it's a partial view. And then the other one is much more around the system of record. That is, um, it is meant for its kind of data at rest. So we could sum this up to say best in class CDP, system of engagement, system of insights. And actually, the, if you want a, a real sort of comprehensive CDP, it, have to, it has to do both. You can't do one or the other. And this leads us to this question, what about DMP? So it's the difference between DMP and CDP. Now, the first time somebody who, because I had covered DMPs for years and I was talking about how great they were. And, um, someone said to me, uh, well, I'm gonna get myself a CDP, so I don't really need a DMP anymore, right? And I was, um, <laughs> I was speechless. I, I didn't understand the the point they were making because, uh, you know, you and I are sophisticated here, just between us. 
Um, and they're totally different, DMP and CDP. They're, they're not the same system. The DMP is, uh, is focusing on the proxy space. It's, it's mostly for, in the past, been for programmatic advertising. And it, uh, when I say the proxy space, there are no names and addresses uh, unencrypted sitting in a DMP. There shouldn't be. Um, or, or if they are, they're not made available. Um, it's, it's, it's an anonymous world and it's built at massive scale. We're talking about billions of impressions in some campaigns and all of that needs to be tracked and, and managed in the DMP. And it's, uh, it's optimized for things like lookalike modeling, use cases for programmatic advertising. The CDP, on the other hand, as I said, is, is CRM for B2C. So it's a, it's a smaller scale in general. No one has billions of customers. Uh, you know, I guess maybe Facebook does, but no normal company has billions of customers. You're talking about, you know, at, at best hundreds of thousands, millions, millions of different customers. Um, but it's deeper data. You, ideally, you'd have a lot. You'd have, you know, point of sale and um, loyalty programs and so on. But it's, it's a known data world. So you can see how um, the fields, the identifiers, the scale, the speed, the requirements for these two systems are different. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's deprecation of third-party cookies, so the DMPs have had to re reinvent themselves in a way and pivot more toward first-party data because it's available. Uh, it's still traditionally, and, and it actually is explicitly, pseudonymous data, so it would be based on a first-party identifier like a hashed email, an encrypted email, or a customer ID, which is just an alphanumeric string. Um, but so the DMPs are kind of repointing themselves, but the CDPs still, you know, thrive and and uh, succeed in the known world. They're the kind of known customers, known prospects. And I think that what happens is these two these two systems are parallel. That you know they're they're parallel and complementary for the foreseeable future, and they converge more and more closely together over time. And and when I say parallel and complementary, what do I mean? Well. To be a little bit more prescriptive and sort of like uh, architectural here, there's the proxy data space, which is the world of the DMP or pseudonymous IDs. And they're not anonymous, by the way. Someone corrected me on this. They're pseudonymous. You do know something about them. You don't know nothing. Um, but And this is collected off of tags, typically pixels on pages or SDKs, uh, and I, they could you know, they could be other identifiers in there, like hashed emails. And they're... Um, uh, they are activated on programmatic platforms, so in, ge in general, but also in site personalization, but it's, it's all di the digital space. Then there's person data, which is collected from loyalty systems, CRM, purchase data. That's piped into, um, it could be a CDP, or if you have your own uh, enterprise data warehouse or data mart, or it's, it's piped into whatever system you use, your single view of the customer. Uh, in Salesforce case, that would be customer 360 audiences, which is our CDP, uh, or contact builder and marketing cloud, for instance, multi-channel journeys. But that's the known space, and it's activated in you know email campaigns, push campaigns, app push, social, Facebook. And the way these two worlds interact, so they're parallel, the way they interact is through a process of onboarding, native onboarding, which is some, um, or through partners, which is where you take a known ID and you sort of find the digital equivalent in, in the digital space. Or if you have consent and consent management is baked in, there's re-identification. So you'd find, uh, you take a digital identifier and then for instance, a hashed email and you'd unhash it. So then it becomes a real email. And you need permission to do that kind of thing, um, obviously explicit permission, um, but it, it can be done. Obviously, you can go one way and you can go the other way. And why is this important? Because look at the customer journey. The customer starts in a space where they don't know you, and they, uh, you have some contact with you. Maybe they click on your ad or they arrive on your website or open your app or whatever. And so then you know a little about them and, and they're in the proxy space and you can start building up a profile with their permission. And if you have real-time interaction management, interaction studio, something like that, you can start personalizing the experience right away, but you still don't know who they are. And then hopefully they become a customer, so they consent, and then they kind of drop down into the CDP space. Maybe they change their email, so you, and, and you can't map that, so then they become unknown again. And the customer journey keeps jumping back and forth between known and unknown. And the, the true, what I would call the true kind of converged CDMP, the vision for this needs to be um, closely aligned or closely coupled systems between pseudonymous and known. 
And if you're having you know, difficulty picturing what's the difference between proxy data and real data, I give you this analogy. This is my cat, Jerry, <laughs> who I put in all my presentations. And the real Jerry is on the right there, and then the, the proxy Jerry, pseudonymous Jerry, is, is on the left. And then what's the vision then? So a true marketing cloud then in the future, and this would be a marketing stack either built um, using single vendor, multiple vendors most likely, uh, would have these components. And the CDP is mostly focused around number one down there, a unified user profile, identity service metadata management. Then the reason to have a great, you know, clean unified user profile, so you can do analytics on it. And by analytics, I mean predictive analytics, um, uh, content recommendations, next best action recommendations, doing segmentation for campaigns, doing personalization, um, you know, discovering insights for product development, all of that, that's the magic that makes marketing so great. Um, but you can't do it without good data. And then in the execution phase, the personalization part, now you, you have to be able to plan campaigns. So most people will continue not to come to your site um, to open your app. Most of your customers will most likely be uh, people who just arrive who are pseudonymous so you need to be able to or or who don't you know reach out to you all that often so you need to be able to plan campaigns in advance still but you also need to be able to react for those who, who do arrive and be contextual and then you have to engage them on the channel of choice you need to be able to analyze and optimize which is number five and then reach out and number six is more around uh, marketing being tied into and related to other parts of the organization, like service and commerce. So recap, CDP is, is for marketers, it's marketer owned. Um, it is, <laughs> somebody told me once, it is the CMO's revenge on the CIO, that's what the CDP is. And it's kind of funny, and what they're getting at there is that um, uh, marketing kind of got tired of sitting in the queue, the IT queue, if they wanted any kind of little updates. So they tend to go and buy their own applications and then, get IT to implement them once as like tag management systems and then give them, you know, login to the UI so they can then start inserting tags and, and doing their own sort of doing their own thing. CDP is like, the, you know, they want their own database now. They want to do their own segmentation. And I think that's great. It reflects rapid jump in number of data sources and the need to do people-based, so individual level marketing. It's an evolution of B2C for CRM. Um, or CRM for B2C, and it has two parts, insights and engagement. Engagement is real-time, insights is um, more around single view of the customer. DMP is a tightly coupled, uh, uh, closely linked system for unknown data, and then it spans insights and engagement, uh, as we've said, and then also the unknown world to the known world. So th those both are very important parts of CDP. And uh, thank you, the whirlwind tour of the CDP. If you'd like any more info, just ask me. If you want to see these slides, contemplate them, or if you'd like more pictures of my cat, Jerry. So thank you very much for joining me.